Dear friends gathered, I invite you to join with me and ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I believe there is a purpose for which you send this word, and you assure us that you're going to accomplish that purpose. Uh, Lord, I, I invite you into our hearts to, to, to give us the, the perspectives of, of joy and peace that is found in your word and, and to see what Christ has done. Bless this preaching of the word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Your 70-year-old self will either be thankful or regretting the decisions you make right now. At least that's what another pastor said. I, I was using one of the apps on the iPhone called Aging Booth to try to envision my 70-year-old self. Here it is. I'm actually okay with this. For my hair, I must be using what Brian Erlacher is using because I still have it. And, and really, just a few more wrinkles and a chubbier face, that's, that's okay. But, but this 70-year-old self is, is hoping that this 30-year-old self is making some wise decisions. See, that 70-year-old self is hoping that I, I plan a healthy habit in eating more salads than donuts, even though I like donuts. It's hoping that I exercise. That, that 70-year-old self is concerned about the relationships that I invest in. That I'm handling with, with grace and love those who are nearest and dearest to me, to my spouse, to my kids, to my friends. That seven-year-old self has some, some thoughts about my walk with God. That seven-year-old self hopes that I have healthy worship habits and, and that I read my Bible and, and that I'm doing all those things to prepare me for an eternal life. That seven-year-old self hopes I'm getting a lot done right now. And what about you? Now, I know there are some kids here, so kids, I know it's hard to imagine your 70-year-old self. Uh, so I had Nadia go to the aging booth. <laughs> Her only comment was, when I'm 70, I am not going to fit into that onesie. <laughs> but I bet kids' 70-year-old selves are hoping that right now you study really hard. That right now you're going to pick up the life lessons your parents are trying to put down. That right now you're, you're learning good work habits so, so that you can work hard someday and be a good employee for the rest of your life. That's what I believe your 70-year-old self is hoping. Now, there are some other people gathered who that 70-year-old self is more easy to imagine. And I bet those, those people are still hoping that you're making some, some wise habits when it comes to your health. Maybe that 70-year-old self is hoping that you don't tap out during the tough times. When a career gets hard or a relationship gets hard, that you play the long game. I bet the seven-year-old self would tell you to do that. That maybe they're, they're hoping you would make some investments in, in finances or relationships or even in your walk with God because your seven-year-old self will know that heaven is coming pretty quickly. Now, th there might be some who are their seven-year-old self. And by the way, uh, you should probably talk to them because the ones that I know in this congregation are smart and wise. You could get a lot from these people here. Um, so for what it's worth. But I also believe that your seven-year-old self is going to want, want you to pick up what we're putting down in this series. Because today we're talking about saving for the future and, and making a financial plan. You, you've come to week two of our series, Give, Save, Live, and it's based on Dave's, Dave Ramsey's budgeting system. That first you give to God, then you save for the future, and then you joyfully live on whatever's left. And that 70-year-old self will really be benefited by doing just that as you plan for the future. But more than any financial campaign or financial series, what we're really doing in this series is taking a look at the heart of God. We explored last Sunday that, that God is a giver. He, he loves to lavish his kids with all good gifts. Anything you have good came from God. Today we see that God the Son, he plans to save. He, he made a radical plan for our salvation and he implemented it and it, it led to our salvation for us to be set free. That's what we'll talk about today. So let's get into it and, and let's hear from the, the heart of God as we turn to the word. Our, our lesson is in, in the worship folder for you. It's recorded by a disciple named Peter. And Peter, just a little background on who he was. He was at one point the biggest coward in the kingdom of God. He was told he was going to deny Jesus three times, warned that he was going to deny him. He said, never, that would never happen, and yet he did it. So afraid that a little girl intimidated him. That's what the Bible says. But then Jesus rose from the dead. 
And God changed his heart. He went from coward to courageous, a leader of the early Christian church, willing to give up his very life to preach this message. What I learn about Peter's story is that God changes things. In fact, could, could you help me out a little bit? Could you just turn to your neighbor and say, God changes things? God changes things. Or say it out loud, God changes things. And that is our hope, whether it be for a relationship, whether it be for a circumstance, and whether it be for your finances, that God, when he's in the mix, he has a way of changing things. There's hope and healing through him. But now as we turn to the word of God, we see that God was a planner, that he had some great plans when it came to our salvation. So First Peter, um, we're going to get into, and here it's recorded, um, we're going to take a look at this whole section and then pick it apart. It says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke the grace of God that was to come to you, they searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. See, God had a plan and they were searching what that plan was. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. This is the word. It's about a plan that God had to save you. And we're going to talk about planning today. May God so bless us as we consider this word. Have you ever asked a question, what's the plan? What's the plan for Thanksgiving, perhaps? By the way, does anyone have Thanksgiving plans all set to go? You know where you're going. Hopefully they include some turkey and football. It's really cold out, so maybe some uh, fuzzy socks and a, a, a warm fire. Uh, what's the plan? It's, it's what we ask uh, for days to come, because in our household, we need to know the plan ahead of time. We do not change the plan the day of. We are not spontaneous, friends. Uh, that doesn't happen. Does anyone relate to that? We need to know the plan for tomorrow and the next day, and we plan that way. What's the plan? It, it may be at what we ask of our elected officials as we're citizens of this country, as we consider the new candidates who took their place in office. What's the plan? It's something that I ask whenever I'm getting into a car where someone else is driving. For if your plan is to take on the spirit of a race car driver and to weave in and out and to go herky-jerky with stopping and going, I am out. Motion sickness is real. What's the plan? What, what's the plan is what believers were asking for millennia over God. They wanted to know his plan of salvation. And for many, many years, they did not know the full revelation of that plan. For example, back when it first began, here was the essence of the plan. That in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. What this was saying, the plan at that time, was that Eve would have a baby that would someday crush the head of the devil and set sinners free. That was the plan. But that was only a hint. And I wonder, did believers in that day, did they get really excited every time Eve had a baby? What were the checkups like? Did they go over like three or four times, eight pounds, seven ounces, but, but is there something marvelous? Is, is this the head crusher, the, the one who's going to take down the devil? Because they didn't know the plan. Well, the plan was revealed a little bit more when Abraham came. And Abraham was told, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. And so people hoisted up the name of Abraham, and, and maybe you've heard that name before. 
And they wondered, is his name great because of the promised land of Canaan? Is that the plan to, to have that land, that, that land of Israel that, that's still coveted today? Is that the plan? The plan was revealed to David. David was told that a king from his line would reign forever. But then shortly after Solomon, his first son, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the, the kingdom split and people scratched their head. What, what, what's, what's the plan? You know, it comes to, to who wrote these words, Peter. Peter had a front row seat to see the intricate plan of God all come together. See, as Peter writes, he, he had just observed Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus dies on the cross, that's the fulfillment of this passage. For there the Son of God, the offspring of Eve, had crushed the head of the devil. As Peter stood on the cross, this is what literally was happening. That the devil, that serpent, his head was crushed even though the heel was struck. That plan had culminated there at the cross. Peter knew about Abraham. That the promised land and the blessing he would bring to all people, it was not a blessing for this life. It was a promised land in heaven where Jesus was going to prepare a place for us. Peter knew about David. That the king that was spoken about is not an earthly king. But as he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, that he would be the king of kings. The one who right now is seated at the right hand of God. That was the plan. And Peter saw this all come together. Not only from the prophecies of Eve and Abraham and David, but, but he saw a virgin birth and, and born in Bethlehem and riding in on a donkey and casting lots for clothing and all these prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. And so do we. Sometimes I'm geeked out that I'm a New Testament believer because what I know is how this plan culminated in the life and the story of Jesus Christ, how he came, how he lived, how he died and rose again all for me, I see the fullness of that plan. And when Peter writes to us, he, he's reminding us what, what joy we have to know that plan. Th those first words, it said that concerning this salvation, people had searched intently and with greatest care. But all the things the prophets had spoken, that they spoke, that have now been told, they were for us. So, so that we would know the culmination of God's salvation plan. And look what he says, even angels long to look into these things. That, that because we know the plan, it makes angels jealous. They would have loved to know. And it made early believers jealous because they would have loved to know. They just had hints. And we have the full revelation of God's plan. Love to talk to you more about that. But what we learn is this, that God had an intricate plan for our salvation And you're saying, well, pastor, what does that have to do with money? I'm glad you asked. Because I believe as God made an intricate plan, so here is wisdom that, that it is wise for us also to make intricate plans. And now my planners in the building, the ones with their calendars all in place, they're poking the person next to them and said, I told you so. He's preaching a good word. It's wise for you to make intricate plans. I consider my own life, I had the framework of a plan. At a young age, I was going to be a pastor with a neon orange Porsche. I grew up in the 80s, so neon was big. Neon orange, I don't know why. Uh, according to my parents, I was going to live in that car because I wouldn't be able to afford anything else. But the pastor in the neon orange, neon orange Porsche, at that time, I was so selfish, I didn't want kids and, and, and I didn't want a wife because I just wanted to live for me. And, and that was the framework of my plan at an early age. But, but God morphed my plan a little bit. I met my wife. We have two daughters. It's a better plan. No neon orange Porsche. I'm okay with that. I got a Hot Wheels car. <laughs> and I've seen God use the framework of my plan and with his wisdom and his care, adjust it just so to get to a point where it's an even better plan that I would have picked. Do you have a plan? When you were a kid, did you have a plan for your life? Right now, do you look ahead to the future? Do you, do you make a five-year or a 10-year or a 20-year plan? I think it is wise, once again, I, I, I'm here to tell you that, that it is good to make those plans. 
In fact, if I scale it down and I make it really practical today, your assignment with the Word of God, your, your homework is this, that you are to plan how much you need to save for your financial future. It is really wise to sit down and consider, what will I need? What may happen? In fact, Jesus even talks about making a plan. When it comes to following him and being, being a disciple, these this were words that he shared. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule, saying, this person began to build but wasn't able to finish. God says, make a plan for that. and Make a plan for your life. Now, when it comes to this assignment and financial planning, there is some really great earthly wisdom when it comes to planning for that financial future. One of the great things to plan for is an emergency fund. And I'm just curious, has anyone planned for an emergency fund? Anyone here today? It can be a really, really good thing. Uh, for example, we know that we will always need a car for transportation, don't we? But no car is going to last forever. I've had ones go over 200,000, but 300,000, not so much. No roof lasts forever. And so it's good to have an emergency fund. In fact, uh, the Bloomer household has one, and we used it last year. Uh, my wife had some cavities, and, and dentists are not free. Um, and it was so great just to know that all those were covered. You could go in for uh, the, the, the filling and the refilling because they got it wrong, and it's all paid for, don't worry, um, because we've got the emergency fund. We, we made a plan. It's also good to plan for retirement, isn't it? That there may come a day when you're not able to work. And so it's good to say, I, I might have to use this much money for this many years and, and make that plan and, and talk about it with maybe your husband or maybe even your kids to, to, to sit down and, and, and draw up what that would look like. The framework of my retirement plan is I hope that if I need to retire, I'm able to retire and that when I retire, if, if possible, that it would not be a burden but a blessing for those around me. That's the framework of the plan. But i got to confess something to you. I am not innately a planner. In, in fact, uh, those who are nearest, close to me are probably laughing right now uh, because they know I'm not innately a planner. And one of the reasons I get frustrated when it comes to planning is because when I make a plan... It doesn't go according to plan. Can I get an amen? Is it, has anyone ever been there? You made a plan, it didn't go. Can you say amen? Yeah. So what do we do with that? Because pastor, yeah, I know I should make a plan. Let's talk about that just a little bit. I consider, you know, those, those things we write when we're seniors in high school, where I'm going to be in 10 years. And I think it'd be interesting to see what went according to plan and what did not. And by the way, sometimes we're very thankful that it didn't go according to plan. <laughs> like if all your high school dreams came true, that, that probably would not be the best thing for you. Uh, the, the, the only thing uh, that, that I got right is that I'd be a pastor. Everything else looked different in my plan. I remember coming across someone whose, whose life did not go according to plan. It was during the, the Great Recession, and I was helping the, the New Lenox Food Pantry. And what we were doing, we were giving away Thanksgiving dinners to those who were in need. And it was so great to be able to help those who were in need. But, but I noticed one lady who was very nicely dressed walk up, and, and I had the spirit of judgment in my heart. You ever been there? I'm like, is she really needy? Forgive me for that. But then she let me in on her story. She said, you know, I, I planned well. When, when we moved to this area, I put 10% down on a house. We've been paying it off. It was... Right within our budget, 25%. But, you know, I've been out of work for months. In fact, my unemployment just stopped a few months ago. I burned through all my savings. See, see I had a plan, but it didn't go according to plan. And, you know, Jesus, he, if you can relate to this on any level, he tells a story about a man's life who did not go according to plan. And let's just look at that parable real quick. Jesus tells this story. A, a great farmer, he, he had a plan. He said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones. There I will store my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. That was his plan. That's a good plan. 
retire early, right? Good plan. But look what God said. God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? It didn't go according to plan. And his cap point, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. I guess God really does think it's good to give first, save second, and live last, to consider where it all came from. I guess it is good to, when we plan, to, to make sure that God is in the mix. And it's not just my earthly plan, but, but it'll be contingent on, on what he says. And see, what I've learned, and I'm still not a good planner, but what I've learned is what God does, that God may disrupt your plan so you don't depend on your plan, but you depend on him. Right? In fact, maybe, maybe for some of you, you you've learned that, that his plans are better, just like I've learned. Maybe for some of you, there, there's a plan that you're, you're tight-fisted, you're clenching onto, that God says, it's okay, you can, you can let that one go, it's all right. It doesn't have to be that specific way. Because I know the plans I have for you. The plans to prosper you and help you, to give you hope in a future. You can, you can trust in me. In fact, when, when it comes to planning, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, he, he said, this is how you should then plan. He said, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. Has anyone ever taught you to end a prayer saying, God willing? That's a good way to pray. That's a good way to plan. And so if you're taking notes, here's what we need to do. We need to make our plans contingent on the plans of God. Yes, it's good to have a framework of what we're going to do in life, but then it's good also to remember who's ultimately in control to be okay when it shifts and changes and moves. You know, when it comes to this financial planning by Dave Ramsey, I have one beef with it. See, he's named this, this course Financial Peace. And my beef with, with what he's saying is that he makes me believe if I have a budget where I give, save, and live, that, that then I will have peace. But the reality is, peace does not come through a plan. Peace comes through the giver of all things who I am dependent on. Not my vision of the future, but the one who holds the future. And if you want financial peace, the greatest thing you can do and make a decision for today is to depend on God and his gracious provision. But here I see how much work I have to do. Because if I'm honest with you, there have been times where I felt the financial pinch and I got the unexpected bill and I said, God, you feed birds and you clothe flowers like you're coming through, right? You ever been there? And if I'm really honest, sometimes I find myself pursuing the material gain, the material riches over the spiritual riches that are available to me. If I'm really honest, sometimes I, I find myself trusting my own workability my visions of the future over what he's going to do. And so today, it's a day of repenting for all the times I haven't been dependent on him for what's coming next. Can you relate? If you can relate at all for not trusting in God, but rather trusting in a bank account, trusting in a company, trusting in what you could do, today is the day to repent of that and leave it here at the cross. Greater than your plan is his provision. And here again we see the glory of Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he made a plan, he anticipated the obstacle of our sin. And Jesus, he saved up enough so that any sinner and any sin could be forgiven. So that we could be set free. And when he saved up, he didn't save up gold, he didn't save up silver. It wasn't a million dollars or a trillion. But Peter reminds us what he stored up. It was the precious blood of Christ. 
That at the cross, there is provision for any and every sin to be paid for. That the storehouse of his grace is enough to set sinners free, and we are free indeed. And I want you to know, even if it's your first time in a church, you have the right to be set free and be called a child of God because of Jesus and his cross for you. His grace is enough. In, in fact, one of my, my, my favorite illustrations of his grace is a financial one. If you've ever been to Starting Point, um, one of the illustrations I give is this. That imagine that Warren Buffett comes to you and he says, let's make a deal. Warren Buffett says, I will give you all my assets and I'll take on all your debts. Sign at the bottom line. Would you do it? I would. So Jesus on the cross, he says, let's make a deal. You give me all the debts, everything your sin had owed, everything it deserved, and I will give you all the assets, my, my righteousness, my forgiveness forever and ever. And that is the deal that we have at the cross. That the one who had no sin became sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God and we are set free. This series is most of all about learning of the heart of God and what he did to save us. But before we go, one final thought. And that is when it comes to our planning, too often we are short-sighted. Too often we don't plan for enough. I recognize this as I had a trip to Lambeau Field, and uh, Bears fans can boo me if you want, but but at Lambeau Field, uh, which was originally created in 1957, uh, called City Stadium, they started with only 32,000 seats. The first time they built, the the seats only went up to where these exits are, 32,000, but the NFL is kind of a big deal. And it's grown in popularity. And they've had revision after revision to where now they seat over 80,000 people because they were too short-sighted in 1957. You ever been short-sighted? I think when Peter looks at my introduction and your 70-year-old self, he would chide me for being short-sighted. Because there's something greater than your 70-year-old self. And that is your eternal self. Yourself that's going to be reigning with Jesus, seeing the face of God in the glory and splendor of that place forever. And that self is hoping you'll set your sights much higher than retirement. In fact, when Peter was writing to us, he said, Would you set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed? Set your hopes not just for this earth. Make plans not just for your earthly self but your eternal self. And some of you are saying, well, pastor, how do I do that? Well, it's good to see you. Do you have a church home? Do you have a way to see Jesus every week and perhaps every day? Are you planning on that? To stay close to God through thick and thin, through the hills and the valleys? You guys say, I think more than anything, it's to see the heart of God every day that we live until we see him face to face. May God bless your plans to do that. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends our understanding may it guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.